Hello, I'm Justin Briley. Welcome to the first in a series of four programmes in which we ask, have we misread the Bible? My guests today are Steve Chalk and Andrew Wilson. Steve Chalk is the founder of the Oasis Trust and pastor of Oasis Church in Waterloo, London. He's a well-known author. He's a leading and sometimes outspoken voice in the British church. In recent decades, Steve has sparked intense debates on issues like doctrines about the nature of the cross, homosexuality. Uh, most recently, he published an article calling for a fresh approach to biblical interpretation. Andrew Wilson is a speaker, author and theologian with the New Frontiers Network of Churches. Andrew takes a more conservative and in his view biblical view on issues like homosexuality and atonement. And his own article on biblical interpretation will be featured in the April edition of Christianity magazine. Well, today they're joining me to talk about whether we need to change the way we read the Bible. Over the course of four programmes, we'll be discussing their different views on the Old Testament, the atonement, homosexuality. And for the articles by Steve and Andrew, and to watch all of these conversations on video, I do encourage you to go to our website, christianitymagazine.co.uk slash Bible debate. Well, in this first program, we're going to be tackling the subject of the authority of scripture. Is it inerrant? Is it infallible? What does it mean to call scripture authoritative? So Steve and Andrew, welcome along to the program Thank today. You. Thank great you. Great to be here. It's great to have you with me. Um, I want, with each of these programmes, because we're tackling quite a, what could be an academic, slightly dry subject to many people, to start with a real world example. And so the one I've thought of today uh, concerns Bart Ehrman. Uh, this is his story, essentially. In his best-selling book, Misquoting Jesus, he describes how, as an evangelical Bible student, he tried desperately to harmonise what he saw as contradictions in Scripture. But one day, after writing a long essay attempting to harmonise Mark naming the priest who gave consecrated bread to David as Abiathar in Mark 2, whereas in 1 Samuel he's referenced as Ahimelech. His tutor simply put at the bottom of his paper, what if Mark got it wrong? And this kind of was a watershed moment, he says, uh, Bart Ehrman says, uh, it convinced him that scripture isn't inerrant and his theological journey continued such that it continued to undermine his trust in the reliability of scripture. In fact, he eventually lost his faith altogether. He's a well-known Bible scholar today, but his story is as well-known as his work, really, in that sense. Okay, so let's start this off before we get into the subject today. Um, is Bart's story a salutary tale of what happens when you start to doubt the inerrancy of scripture? What do you think, Steve? I think it's a salutary tale of what happens when you have um, too shallow a view of what the Bible is, and that's all I'm trying to point people to. Over the years I've been a Christian, I became a Christian when I was 14, um, I've seen so many people who've been absolutely full on about their faith, but I've seen people who've been full on about their faith without thinking it through. And then when they're confronted by the discrepancies in the text, etc. Because this faith has been shallow, built on the Bible's true, literally true, all of it, that kind of statement, um, everything crumbles. And so what sustained me in my faith and what I hope for others is that they, you enter uh, and you journey in your faith and your acceptance of the Bible as our sacred text um, thinking seriously about what it is and what it isn't, okay. instead of making wild claims, which then leave lots of people um, crashed later in life. Sticking with Bart Ehrman just for a moment there, Andrew, what, what yeah. do you make of his tale? I, I think for somebody to have a faith that is shallow enough, I, I actually completely agree with you. I would just think if people, somebody's faith is shallow enough for their supervisor to write, have you really considered all the options here at the bottom and to find that that means they lose their faith I just I think is it's very sad I, I mean I it's important if, if Bart's watching to note say yeah. that that wasn't as it were the point at which he yeah. lost his faith altogether yeah. but no, it's certainly but, the start of a journey but, but, towards a more but you know view. you see yeah. so yeah. I, I think kind of broaden it out I was um, I was looking at the other month um, at, at a website from a church that said you know, we're Bible believing, we believe the Bible. 
And that always raises a question for me. What do they think the other churches do? You know, <laughs> we believe Harry Potter. You know, kind of, of course people believe the Bible. Okay. So it's all about interpretation and depth of understanding. Indeed, isn't it? indeed. Now yeah. that's obviously where your article's coming from, yeah. the, the longer version you've, you've titled Restoring Confidence in the mm. Bible. I mean, let, let's start off with, with you though, Andrew. What, what do you do with, for instance, mm. apparent contradictions in scripture? Well, I think it's, it's got a lot of it's to do with starting point, right? So I think my starting point, I suppose three things I don't know, but I imagine they would probably separate the way we would read it. I think three words I would use to describe the Bible would be authoritative, truthful, and word of God, which I think are probably three of the things we discuss over there. So I would, I would affirm all of those three things. That the mm -hmm. Bible's authoritative, it's truthful, and it's the word of God. And that means that when I come to uh, a, an area in the Bible where I go, goodness, that, that looks to me puzzling. Um, there's much more obvious ones than that one. Mm. I'll talk about that in a sec. But, um, but you know, even in Proverbs, when it just puts two completely opposite things next to each other in 20, Proverbs 26, do you or do you not answer a fool according to his folly? You're forced to go, well, that is in any meaningful sense of the word, completely opposite statements. But I've now got to think, what's, what does the text, what am I supposed to do with a text like that that puts these opposite statements next to each other and think it through? And that's probably quite an obvious example because it's so mm. blatant. Yeah. There's, so then a, there's when almost meant to be a contradiction. Yeah, exactly. There is. Yeah. And, and, and then, if, then you sort of step out from that and you say, well, then what about when you have div you know, divergent accounts of the same event? And you think, so mm. what, again, what are these different, what's the way Matthew's done that, yeah. the way Luke's done that, supposed mm. to tell me? What am I supposed to learn from it? So it's rather than, it's certainly, I'd, if we're talking about the difference between literalism and non-literalism, then I'm absolutely with Steve. I think you can't read the Bible as, or, as if it's all literally true. It's not intended to be taken that way. It's not a literal text. But when it makes historical claims, and those historical claims might appear to be in conflict, particularly in an English version, I sort of I do some study. I think rather so. My default would be this is authoritative. It's truthful. It's the word of God. So it's going to have a consistency to it, but it might take more time to find it. So in that particular instance, it involves going into. I think it does involve going into Greek and seeing that the phrase in the epi, the, the upon Abiathar, who's the name of the high priest, might mean in the days of. It might mean when he was the high priest, which is how okay. it's often translated. But it might even mean in the bit about, which is what it means in Mark okay. twelve twenty six. So I just look. So, at so you would say, look for a way. You you you. I look you, at an, an inner logic in the text that would explain why, why there, there there is an apparent contradiction. And, then, and actually, even in Mark's own gospel, there is an example of exactly that later on in the very gospel. So I'd, I'd kind of look at it and say, well, actually, the grammatical construction is the same in Mark one and two as it is in Mark twelve. And would you, would this I'll give you the that. confidence in the end that you do believe the Bible is in that sense infallible? Is that a word? Yeah, you I would, do you believe would use? it, but I don't think. I do believe the Bible is infallible, but I, I wouldn't. I find that that word, and even more so the word inerrant, can often imply all sorts of things that I don't mean. So I'd always be quite careful about it. You know, it sort of implies like you're affirming starting in the wrong place. It's like someone says, "My wife is five at five. and you think that's true, but it's not the most useful. Well, yeah. It's not in the top twenty things I'd want you to know about it. <laughs> but I do happen to believe it's true. Let, so let's maybe pass that's it over to Steve. Well, I think the problem um, to start with inerrancy and infallibility. I mean, for a start, there's huge fallout amongst Christians. Some who believe the Bible's infallible, and some people who believe it's inerrant, and they battled each other over this as you. As if they sure mean well vastly know. different things. Yeah, which is ridiculous. Whereas ninety nine percent of the world hasn't got a clue <laughs> what either statement means, mm. but what they do believe it means is this book is beyond questioning. Whatever it says, I have to believe and I can't, I can't question it, I can't doubt it, I can't debate it, I can't dispute it. And I think any healthy church is a church that can do all of those things, debate right. and dispute, etc, etc. I believe, actually, that the Bible has huge authority. It is authoritative. I believe that it is truthful. I'm not sure it's helpful to call it the word of God because really? I think that Jesus is the word of God. Okay. Yeah, no, so I think it's, it's word, uh, yeah. So Even though Jesus calls reason, the Bible the word yeah, of God. Well, so. I, I think again, what you're gonna do, Andrew, is, to, is ask the question about what Jesus meant when he was saying that, exactly yeah. what you've just said. But I think that you end up with this. I think David Watson, who, you know, this uh, evangelical charismatic leader who uh, had, was so influential on me and many people uh, when, as a young guy, he said, we end up believing in the Father, the, S the Son, and the Bible. Mm. Um, so Jesus is the word of God, which is again, of course, what scripture says, that in Jesus we see God as he is. Now, well, now the thing is, can, other, I, can I say, but I do want to say this, I do want to say this, there's a certain kind of uh, evangelicalism, it's only a certain kind of evangelicalism, 
that will always say exactly the point. We believe the Bible is authoritative. If you believe anything else than what our um, readings are, you somehow don't believe in its authority. Right. It's because I believe, I've spent my whole life being inspired by the Bible, it's because I'm inspired by the Bible that I'm grappling with yeah. it. Yeah, but, so, I, I, but nobody's, I, I don't think anybody's saying that you I shouldn't be able authority. to discuss what the Bible means or mm. even that we shouldn't be able to grapple with it. I mean, I'd certainly, I'm not saying that, but I think mm. if the if Jesus speaks of the yeah. word, the Bible is the word of God, why would you say he's wrong? I, I mean, No, no, what I'm saying is... Or why would you say a, we shouldn't use in that a, In a primary... Oh, I think, your argument, Andrew, I think we have to be very careful about the... The language we use, I suppose, at the end of the day, if you put it like this, I think this is my problem, if you like. Um, I'm an evangelist. I'm always asking myself the question, how does this language actually spill out to people who aren't already part of our club? So we know the inner meaning. So if I was listening to you preach and you talked about the Bible as the Word of God, Andrew, I wouldn't, I'd go, yeah, fine, I understand that. Yeah. But I just think that all of this is massively sure. unhelpful so when you, used you in do contemporary believe the, society. Just, you believe the Bible's the Word of God, but you wouldn't want to say it was to I, an no, unbeliever? No, 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 no. What I want to say is, first and foremost, what I think the New Testament, the Word of God, says time and time again Time and time again, it's Jesus that's the word of God. It only God. says that it's, in four places, yeah, and, it, it, and it says well, about 280, well, you know, 280 with, references to the... No, without no, but, getting into, without, <laughs> Andrew, without... It is important, but, but it should... No, no, because like we can't have... Remember, let's, no, no, you say time and time again. Let's let Andrew develop that thought, because I think we need to hear what I'm not... I think the Bible only needs to say something once to be true, and I'm absolutely agreeing that Jesus is the word of God. I think the time and time again thing, you've basically got four references to Jesus... So it's true because it says it once. Four references... Yes, it is. Is, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, of course I'm not denying Jesus is the word yeah. of God. What I think you're doing though is saying because Jesus is the word of God, the Bible is not, no, or no, we need to be, care hang on, no, about, need to be okay. careful about saying that. And what I'm saying is Jesus is the word of God, the yeah. Bible is the word of God, the gospel is the word of God, and none of those things conflict. I think you're saying you have to no, choose, no, no. and I'm saying no, you don't. Yeah, no, there's I'm no reason saying, why I'm I should saying, have to. I think that what I'm saying, to peel it back and then come back at this, what I'm saying is that I do believe that uh, the Bible is true. Of course I believe the Bible is true. Base my life on that. Mm you know, state my life on it. Um, I do believe the Bible is authoritative, but I also believe that the Bible's saying different things in different places. The Bible actually is a library, not a book. The word Bible means books. It is a library. And then when you walk into a library, you walk into a library with a different sense than you sure. open a book. Because when you walk into a library, you understand that all of these books they're there for reference, and sometimes they'll be saying the same thing, and sometimes different things. Sometimes they'll have different agendas, different insights, etc., etc. So, for instance, the prophet Isaiah has a different view of Jerusalem reconstituted than Ezra or Nehemiah. They are much more exclusive, he's much more inclusive. The writer of Leviticus has a different view about sacrifice than Hosea. Jesus, here's the point, Jesus has a different view uh, about uh, some of the teaching in the Torah uh, that you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I'm telling you it's like sure. this. So uh, that's why I would say Jesus is the centre, Jesus is the lens. And, and it's all... Agree, yeah. Jesus is the yeah. centre, I agree yeah. is the lens. Yeah. What I'm trying to get you to uh, yeah. either say yes or no to, would yeah. you, do sure. you think... If you if there's no non-Christians listening, yeah. you'd say no, no, the, I, yeah. I know that's I'm not very, true. No, I hope there no, are. But, but, not right, no, I agree. But let's no, say that let's say there are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's yeah. say let's say you're suddenly you're not worried about how it might be heard by someone yeah. who doesn't understand the language. The, is it me? Is it true yeah. to say the Bible is the Word of God, and the Gospel is the Word of God, and Jesus is the Word of God? And I'm this, affirming all three, yeah, and I, I think yeah. you're affirming one at the exclusion no, no, no. of the other in two. This context, sounds like it. No, Andrew. In this context, having had this discussion with this person who's not a Christian or and has been disillusioned by the church, listening, I'm very happy now because we've spelt it out yeah. instead of using a soundbite right. to say, of course, the Bible is the Word of God, but. We read the Bible, I read the Bible, through the lens of Jesus, which is what I think the Bible itself calls me to do. And, I, sometimes, I, 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 and sometimes Jesus, what he says, is at odds with. So, for instance, on the Sabbath day, you know, the very stories we've been talking about, Jesus says, well, you understood the Sabbath like this because you never understood that. 
Yeah. So he'd take what's sure. said and he'll disagree uh, I mean, with it and move the thing on. Do, do, you, Jesus is the lens. That's what but I'm he's not dis yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, we'll when, so when Steve says, for instance, Andrew, the word of God is ultimately a person, mm. not a manuscript. Do yeah. you think he's making a false dichotomy there I, in some I do. Way? I mean, I think I would say ultimately, I think the final and most, if you take word of God as the speech of God, Jesus is the, fine, uh, the finest, most excellent, fullest description of the revelation of God. And he only needs to say that once. And he had, does say it four times. So there's absolutely no need to quibble with that. It's particularly in John's theology, it's a, and I think exclusively really in John's theology, that is his language for Jesus in a very powerful way. Well, it, but, Hebrews but it, as well. And Hebrews, know, so of course, yeah, doesn't yeah, use yeah. The, la the word, the, the, yeah. that phrase, but he has exactly the same. And I think they all do. I think they yeah, would all yeah. say, this is what yeah. you look like to see God, um, what you look at to see God. But I, I wouldn't play that against. And it may, there may be less disagreement here than it appears, but I think Steve's very nervous, it sounds like Steve is very nervous of the idea of somebody saying, the word of God says, the word of God came no. to, or even in Jesus' language, it is written. No, what, what and I'd I, be saying, I want to, I don't think, I think restoring confidence in the Bible what, involves people knowing that yeah. it is the word of God and what that I'm, God what, has spoken. What I'm nervous of, Andrew, is something entirely different. <coughs> I'm nervous of people reading Old Testament texts and then applying them. I think if you sure. and, and then applying them without filtering them through the lens of Jesus. I mean, so well, Jesus, yeah. you know, even, even in the Gospels, they're taking this woman to be stoned to death and Jesus says, stop. So I think that there are many Old Testament passages and some New Testament ones actually, but many Old Testament passages that have been used to oppress people, that have been used to destroy civilizations that have been used in lots of violent and brutal ways, but if you looked at the lens of Jesus, yeah. you'd I mean, this, stop this, and you'd this, go in a different this will direction. bring us into so next week's to topic that, to some extent. Me. But, but yeah. in that sense, Steve, are you willing to say, for instance, that some of the passages in the Old Testament are, in a sense, people misread, misheard, n n had a wrong view of God, and that in that sense, that those passages are are wrong in some sense, i.e are not authoritative as far as the nature of God. No, let, let me state it again. What I believe, what I'm saying is that the Bible is a library and every single book in this library is a fantastic interaction with God. And God is slowly pulling people along, slowly pulling them out of their paganism, out of their misrepresentations of who he is, and he's slowly moving them to who we finally see in Jesus. And so not every voice represented in the Bible um, is absolutely accurate. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, for instance, Jesus says, no, 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 that's not the way it is. I think if you understand the Bible just in terms of the development of the human race, you know, there you have this rich, fertile Near East um, where, where civilization <coughs> and community develops. And you compare the biblical texts, because the Bible is lots of texts, mm. not one text, with lots of opinions. If you compare the biblical text to other texts around it in the Near East at the time. Um, I, I was just talking to someone yesterday who said they've been to the Louvre Gallery to see the Mona Lisa. And I, did, I said, did you go in and see Hammurabi's Code? And they said, what's that? I said, it's the best thing the Louvre Gallery's got. And they said, what's that? I said, it's like the Ten Commandments on stone. It's the stone of the king, and it predates the Ten Commandments stone by 500 years. It's a code in uniform. It's the rules of that society written down. Now, if you read, you can read it because it's translated into English. Mm. It's, ten, mm. it's seven feet high, this thing. At 500 years before the Ten Commandments, if you read that code, you see how the civilizations around um, Israel operated. And then you understand how the Levitical code is moving sure. the people forward. It's but Jesus comes to move us forward yeah. again. And the Bible, and, I and, think, and this has is the idea of, of in that progressive revelation in Scripture. This is the idea that, that, if you like, as Jesus said, I came to fulfill the mm. law and the prophets and so on, Andrew. But, but where's the dividing line, I suppose? Uh, uh, can, can you then can say of, of things that are. Jesus gives help on this. And I'm, I'm going to need your protection from interruptions here because I'm, okay. I'm just. Okay. There was a long good story about the Louvre there. Let, but let's yeah, give yeah. you plenty awesome. of time to, to explain. Think, you go see it. It's amazing. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and you mean it's in cuneiform rather than in uniform, yeah, yeah, I assume. Yeah, if it's in right, uniform, yeah, that yeah. would look yeah, yeah. very <laughs> hilarious, <laughs> I imagine. Yeah. Um, so the, 
I think we've got, Jesus is very helpful for this at the start of the Sermon on the Mount. So he affirms the, the two things alongside each other, which I, I sense Steve is affirming one at the exclusion of the other, and I think we need to hold both. Okay. Um, and I may be wrong that he's affirming one, but I think, I think it sounds like that. And so there's this neither, not, don't think I've come to abolish the law, not a jot or a tittle is going to disappear from it. That's one side to affirm. The it is written, it is written, it is written. The scriptures must be fulfilled. It's written. The word of God cannot be broken. It's written, it's written. The scriptures are going to be done. Blah, 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 till your cows come home. You know, it's incredible just going on and on and on about the authority and accuracy of scripture and often affirming some of the bits that we really wish he wouldn't, I think, and actually being very careful to spell out this is God's word, this is to be submitted to as authoritative. And then he says, don't, don't think that I've come to, um, sorry, no, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so alongside this idea that it's the word of God, we also need to have the idea that it's an unfolding story, which I think is a better word than conversation for me, because mm. conversation between whom, it's sort of, mm. it, it, that's not the only angle on it, is it? That we're having a conversation, but there's actually a narrative taking place. And so I think, you know, people like Tom Wright, very helpful on this, in, saying Jesus, says just because it's the word of God doesn't mean that every instruction in it needs to be applied in today's life with exactly the same force or application because it referred to Israel wandering in the desert and then it referred to Israel in the land and out the land then back in the land. So it would be flat literalism to apply all instructions on this one I think we can entirely agree uh, in the same way. So sure. and Jesus says I'm the, now the climax of that story. But I think what's What's difficult or dangerous actually is when people push one of those two halves of what he says in Matthew 5, 17 and so on to the exclusion of the other. So you have some people who would say the Bible is the word of God and therefore all of it should be applied in the same kind of way to our lives today, which is, I think we both agree is foolish. But others, and I think this is where Steve's going, say no, the Bible is fulfilled in Jesus, the story of Israel is fulfilled in Jesus, and therefore we shouldn't affirm the truthfulness of what came before it. We should say that was, rather than saying Jesus said that was true for then, but it's not what I want you to do now, mm. instead I think Steve is saying, no, it wasn't, it wasn't even they right got then. It wrong, they got then. it wrong. So when yeah. Nahum says the Lord is a jealous and vengeful God, I think Steve would say, no, he's not. Nahum's just wrong about that. And I don't think Jesus would have any trouble with that because it, it, it is written, it's I, written, I, the I, scriptures okay, are yeah. fulfilled. So, so it's holding both so together the, way, the concerns. Yeah. Yeah, so the way I'd understand that is that Jesus does say, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, <coughs> that, uh, you know, I've come to fulfill the law, not to discredit it. But having said that, what he actually does is said, well, if you read that in black and white, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and did it, I'm telling you that you never understood the spirit of it, what's be beneath it and beyond it. So if you, if you enforced that, you made a mistake. So... Let's let's go back and take. No, I don't, no, yeah, uh, yeah, that's not well, yeah. So, but I think that's how it comes across. You see, and I think that's how most people understand this. So, I think we've got to be clearer about you what we're Jesus is saying. Moses. So, if somebody yeah. in the if somebody in the thirteenth century BC mm. was actually to follow that. You think Jesus is saying nobody should ever have done this? It's not that it. It's not that well, it was true. I do think. I do think he was saying it's never that way that it was meant to be. Because because God was always trying to point you to something underneath that. The eye for nine, a tooth for a tooth. It was about justice, really, wasn't it? Which is what you come to understand if you read it in context. And Jesus is saying, when he stands on that, that mountain with his friends and followers, what I was, you know, you should have seen the justice underneath it. Rather than and interpreting it as ra revenge. Yeah, and it yeah. was interpreted, <coughs> the, yeah, literally. Well, and I that's been wrong. A and, and, yeah, well, just, just, just so... Jesus also says that about the Sabbath, doesn't it? If only you'd have understood mm. God's justice, you'd have never done these things in this way. So you see, the other issue that's not been faced here is what is the Bible? Because the, um, the Protestants, I'm a Protestant, we've got 66 books, but we used to have more when we just had the King James Version. Um, okay, the Catholics so what, what makes more up the books, canon? The yeah. Orthodox Church is split and it okay. has an it. Yes, yeah, so the question is, when you say, well, Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets, actually, if you look at Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Venaticus, which is our closest guesses at uh, uh, these things, they're not the same as the Bible okay. we have well, now. Which, and all I'm arguing no, and he's not talking about, of course he's not talking I'm, about either yeah, of those codices, yeah, yeah, he's talking no, about these exactly. Old Testament all, scriptures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but, and as you, as you know, well, it, it's just that they contain a version of the Old Testament scriptures or a selection of the books. They leave some in that we've left out, etc., etc. All I'm saying, Andrew, is that what Jesus is talking about, I think, when he says, I've not come to destroy the law, 
but to fulfill it. He's saying, I'm driving you back to the spirit of the thing. Let's and let's I let's embody the Let's allow of Andrew thing. to respond I, and I'd we'll just start and to I'd wrap ag- things I'd up. I'd agree that he's correcting yeah. misinterpretation and yeah. misapplication. But you're going further than that. You're saying there's errors and contradictions yeah, there in, are in, errors the, and right. well, Jesus, in and, the text. And this is what I'm saying. Hang on, hang let's, on. Let, yeah. This is what I'm saying. Jesus' approach to the Old yeah. Testament simply doesn't seem to work like that. Yeah. He, he seems to be just happy willy-nilly to affirm the historicity of everything that comes up. Anytime he mentions it, he seems to be... He hang on. He, 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 talks about a, he talks about a lot of things. Yeah. He's often talking about Old Testament stories yeah. on the basis that they happened. He's saying, yeah, it's written. The scriptures can't be broken. He, so, he doesn't have the so attitude of... Hang on. He doesn't have the attitude to scripture that a postmodern Westerner would like him to have. Yeah. He yeah. he seems much less embarrassed of it than I think you so, are. So Jesus affirmed the infallibility of scripture as far he, as you're he, No, concerned. because he, of course that, that language was not in no. existence in that no. in his day. But I think if somebody had come up to Jesus and said, do you think the Bible, come on, we given the wife five foot five thing, right? The Old Testament scriptures that you've got, the 22 scrolls, are there, are there mistakes in there or not? I think he'd have stared at you in disbelief, thinking, what on earth are you talking about? This is the word of God. Yeah. God has spoken. These, he would unroll the scroll and he'd read it and he'd preach from it as if it's completely true. So the truthfulness of scripture, I think if we want to yeah. say, oh, no, 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 Jesus thought the Bible was part of an emerging sacred conversation that might have landed us to where Westerners have got to if we just got there quick, like, quicker. I think Jesus said, that's not how I see it. I see this as a inspired, okay. sacred right, we'll, text. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to pick this up again next week, Steve. Yeah. And so yeah. um, uh, we, we, we do need to draw things to a close, unfortunately, just because time's against us. Um, you've, you've started, whether we call a Bible conversation, you've certainly started a conversation, <laughs> Steve, and, and we are going to continue it next week with your, um, with your new article. Um, If you're listening and you'd like to respond to anything you've heard on the programme today, do encourage you to get in touch. Uh, Be delighted to hear from you. Uh, Go to the web page to find out more about how to do that, where you can find today's conversation as a video and indeed our other conversations as they emerge. Uh, That's at uh, christianitymagazine.co.uk slash Bible debate. So next time... Steve and Andrew are going to be joining me to talk about Old Testament morality. Uh, How should we interpret those tough bits of scripture? Uh, So do check us out again next week, same time. And I do hope you can come back for more discussions on the Bible as we ask, have we misread it?